Of course, of course, help yourself. Okay, so amino acids um, on paper, very simple, right? It's just an amine and an acid in the same molecule. There's an amine group. There's an acid group sorted. That's an amino acid. Um, we usually work with amino acids, the natural amino acids, where your, your nitrogen's attached to the the, the first carbon next to the acid, sometimes called alpha amino acids. Um, but really, any, any long chain of carbons with an acid at one end and an amine at the other end would be an amino acid. Uh, this carbon in the middle, well, let's just put a hydrogen there for the moment. But um, the other position there, um, we can put a range of different compounds on there. And that range of different compounds will give us, sorry, range of different groups there, will give us a range of different compounds. And that gives us the natural amino acids. And there's 20 odd of them. So just by putting different things there, prefer a methyl group or a, another amine or another acid or just a long chain of carbons. There's all sorts of things I can add to that. You can look them up. There's lots of amino acids and they have exciting names like serine and arginine and so on. Um, you only need to be familiar with, with a couple, and the, the rest, I think, are just any extras that you needed are, are, are printed on the, the, uh, the data sheet. I can't remember if you have a copy of this data sheet. Not that one, not the other data sheet. Um, yeah, that's it. You, you've got it. Uh, you get a bunch of, bunch of exciting organic stuff printed on your data sheet. Um, the full the full one is is like an A3 sheet folded out. Do you have one of these? Fancily called a data booklet. Oh, you've got one. Anybody else has got one there? You don't really need to have one particularly, but um, I do, do have a few. I mean, obviously, I get about about twenty odd. Yeah, there we are. They give you they give you a bunch of different amino acids on the sheet there to to look at. Uh, um, yeah, there we are. We've got alanine, aspartic acid, cysteine, lysine, phenylalanine, serine. Okay. So for, for all of those amino acids, you'll notice that they all have an NH2 at one end, a COOH at the other end, a CH in the middle, and then that, that R group is the only bit of the molecule which is changing. Okay. So uh, let, let's, let's just leave it as an R group for the moment and focus on the amine and the acid bit. So the first thing to bear in mind about amino acids is that they have all the reactions that you'd expect amines to have, and they have all the reactions that you'd expect carboxylic acids to have. And the wonderful thing about organic chemistry is that I can deal with those functional groups in isolation, and I can just think about the amine group, and I can just think about the acid group, and I can come up with, with substances that will only react with, with either one. So a really simple approach would be acids and bases. Okay. If I react, say react this with HCl, and then an alternative, I will react it with NaOH. Could you draw me the structure of the substance I would make if I reacted? This, some of this amino acid with HCl and some of this amino acid with NaOH. Bunk. Um, so yeah, acids, uh, as I put here, acids react with bases, of course. 
the basic part of the group is the amine, just like ammonia, amines are bases. So uh, we would end up with an extra proton protonating our nitrogen, and the rest of the molecule would just be the same. Whereas when I start with the base, bases react with acids, right? So the amine would, would be untouched and we get something like a sodium salt at, at that end there. Um, of course, uh, I haven't put the, the chloride in here. The chloride would be, be presumably hanging around somewhere there. But in general, uh, any low pH situation is going to protonate my nitrogen. If it just says low pH in the question, you don't, you don't have any chlorides knocking about. Any, any high pH situation is going to deprotonate the, the, the acid. So if you start thinking about it, there must be... Hang on, so if, if low pH does this and high pH does that, what happens when we start to slide towards neutral? Do we get a point where neither of these reactions happen, or do we get a point where they both happen? That's exactly what we get. So we can imagine a situation in which the proton on the acid protonates the base or the amine. The carboxylic, carboxylic acid proton comes off and joins on the nitrogen on the other end. This is only going to happen at a special pH. Now you might think, yeah, that has to be pH neutral. But actually it depends on the R group. And we already talked about the base strength of amines depending on different R groups that use the positive inductive effect to shove electrons down the carbon chain and so on. So we know that different groups around amines and of course carboxylic acids can, can change that enormously. So the point at which, the pH at which amino acids does this changes for the different amino acids. Unfortunately, you, you don't have to remember what they are. What you do have to remember is that this point or this form of the amino acid is called its zwitter ion, which is a, a lovely word. Um, and it's how the amino acids uh, bond with each other when they form compounds. So if you're looking at a solid amino acid, um, the, the solid amino acid is, is in the form of a zwitter ion which explains why amino acids have rather high melting points, higher than you would expect for standard carboxylic acids and amines. I mean, these are most carboxylic acids would be boiling in the range of 100, maybe 150, but uh, amino acids can have melting points in the 300s, 400s, because of that extra bit of ionic bonding that's, that's coming from the, from the zwitter ion. Okay, um, just, just going back to reactions again, since you all seem to struggle a little bit with acid and base, let's up the ante a bit. Um, what would I get if I added this amino acid to uh, some ethanol in the presence of a little bit of conch H2SO4 catalyst. What if I added it to um, some bromoethane? Or some uh, acid chloride? or even a bit of ammonia. See if you can come up with products for that amino acid reacting with those four substances.
So yeah, number one, we've got an alcohol and a carboxylic acid consulfuric catalyst. We make an ester. So the amine from the other end doesn't get touched. And the new bit of the molecule is the ester. The second one, bromoethane, you can picture your nitrogen lone pair coming into the carbon, delta plus carbon, kicking out the bromine. So we make that chappy there. Acid group goes untouched. The acid chloride, so again, the reaction you've learned is addition elimination, nitrogen lone pair again attaching the, attacking the carbon, electrons hop onto the oxygen for a beat and then and then come back. Uh, what am I doing now? And make that amide. Let's go down that way. There we go. Uh, we could also make an anhydride under slightly con different conditions, but I didn't give you any conditions, so um, they would definitely give you credit for that in an exam. And ammonia. What does ammonia react with? What was that an answer? Because ammonia is, it's a base. So ammonia is just going to react with. Uh, what <laughs> just reacts with, reacts with the acid end because ammonia is a base and acids and acids and acids and bases get together and do their salt thing. Okay, the most famous, or the reaction that amino acids are most famous for, of course, is reacting with each other to form long chains called polypeptides, and then those polypeptides fold up in special, amazing AI-computed ways to make proteins. Um, so the reaction that happens, it's a condensation reaction, a bit like making an ester, we could imagine our um, water being removed there. Of course in biology this happens with enzymes picking up the different amino acids and sticking them together in complicated and amazing ways. Doing this. So notice my, my amino acids are different now. Okay. So that's our new amide bond that we've made. Of course, biologists don't call it an amide, they call it peptide. You call it a peptide in the exam. The examiner will smile, say, ah, oh, biologists, and give you a tick. 
So it's usually described as the amide linkage or the peptide linkage. It's the new bond that joins the two amino acids together. Um, you, you, again, you don't need to know this. This is called glycine, by the way, and this is called alanine here. Um, so we've got the glycine end and the alanine end. But of course, there's another way of putting these two amino acids together, isn't there? Right. I could have alanine over here and glycine over there, and then it's not symmetrical. At the moment, glycine has the NH2 end and alanine has the acid end. If I switched it around, I would have the, the alanine over here and the glycine over there. That would be a different molecule. So even with just two amino acids, we can make two different dipeptides, as they're called, dipeptide. Just with two amino acids. Of course, if we had three amino acids and we were making a dipeptide, we could make, how many is that? Six different possibilities. And then if you had 20 amino acids and you were joining hundreds of them together, the, the number of possibilities is legion, so where the, the ways in which we can join amino acids, it's like letters of the alphabet, isn't it? If you've got 20 different letters in the alphabet and you join them together in long strings, you can make quite a lot of words. I think we'll all agree there's a lot of words out there. Most of us don't know many of them, really, unless you're Shakespeare. Um, and biology knows a lot more. Uh, okay. So we can end up with long strings uh, of, of amino acids, um, which make polypeptides and proteins. And I, I'm not going to go into the detail. It's all in the topic booklet there. Um, there we are on page, whatever page that is, eight. They can um, twist themselves into an alpha helix, or they can get into a sort of beta pleated sheet. Uh, again, biologists will, will know all about this kind of stuff. The important thing that, that we would focus on as, as biologists is what holds it all together. So if you look in the, the alpha helix structure, which is just basically a big long chain of amino acids going round and round and round in a big, big spring, we'll have some amino acids here with a you know, a carbonyl there sticking out, and one of these carbonyls, and we'll have another amino acid down here with a NH kind of sticking out from, from somewhere else in the molecule, and between those two, let's just put in our lone pair, there we are, we can get some hydrogen bonding. Of course, hydrogen bonds are one of the stronger types of intermolecular forces, so we can, we can imagine how that will hold everything together. Um, the other important link that you need to know about, um, which, which is not in the alpha helix, but it comes later on. Uh, I've got a picture of these, haven't I? A picture of haemoglobin or something. Hang on a second, let me just find that. All right, there it is. Yeah, I've got, a, I've got a picture of that on page nine, uh, but without the full colour. That, that's myoglobin, actually. So you can see lots of these little, little twists. If you don't have your booklets with you, don't worry, it'll be up on the screen in a moment. Yay! It's a riot. So you're looking at, you're looking at one single chain of amino acids. It's kind of looping around here, and, you know, it's just it's like the best Alton Towers ride ever. Um, these are the these are the alpha helix bits there then. So those are the bits that are held together with hydrogen bonding. But once the whole the the whole um, 
polypeptide kind of <laughs> folds in on itself, it still needs something to hold it holds itself together. So where these where these strands kind of come up against one another, uh, we have a um, oh, that should be an end. Um, that's, that's a bit of an amino acid. Uh, we have these uh, um, amino acids called cysteine, which is just a CH2 and then a thing O, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, cysteine is a sulfur hydrogen group, uh, or has a sulfur hydrogen group. It looks a bit like a, an alcohol, doesn't it? Except with sulfur instead of oxygen. It's called a thiol. Don't need to know that. But uh, what can happen is if we have two, uh, two cysteines, uh, different part, parts of the, the molecule. So here's another one over here. Okay, so we've got one long chain here and another long chain there. Where the two cysteines meet, these sulfurs can actually join together and make a sulfur bridge. And that will hold, that will hold the protein in, in place there. Okay. Um, yeah. It's kind of quite beautiful, really, isn't it? You should should be able to draw a sulfur bridge. Yes, yes. I mean, it is. Uh, is the structure of cysteine in your? Um, yeah, it's on the back. It's on the thing. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm assuming that's a that's a question. It's definitely part of the curriculum. You need to know about the sulfur bridge. Um, so. So here's our here's here's a kind of an image of a of a of a protein forming. So each of these circles is one of the uh, one of the amino acids, and we've got about a hundred and something, hundred and twenty amino acids in the chain. Um, and uh, there's the acid end, and there's the there's the amine end, and then where these where these pairs of cysteines form. They can they can link together and that will kind of clamp that that shape of the amino acid in uh, shape of the protein in place um, to, to give it a an overall three dimensional structure because of course amino acids once they form polypeptides polypeptides don't have a three dimensional structure do they they're, they're just chains they're just long you know spaghetti like polymers so we need something to hold it all together so the hydrogen bonding will hold the alpha helix. Sulfur bridges, and of course we can get little, uh, we can get ionic attractions. If you've got an NH3 plus somewhere and a COO minus, we can get some ionic attraction holding it together. We could even get a few van der Waals forces if you just had some carbon groups. Um, so yeah, the, the proteins using all of the, all of the tools that in the in the chemist's toolkit to, to glue itself together. Say no, twenty one amino acids there are. Um, now, one of the important aspects of amino acids is the Just, should we just use cysteine for the moment? There we are. It is the fact that there are, of course, four different groups around that central carbon. If it's not glycine, glycine's the most boring of the, or the simplest of the amino acids. But if we have any of the other amino acids where the, where the R group is something interesting, um, we have four different groups around a carbon. If we have four different groups around a carbon, then... We have optical isomerism. That carbon there with four different groups around it is, what's the word for it? Begins with C? Chiral. chiral. Okay, so we've got a, a chiral molecule with a chiral carbon in it. Mother Nature is very uh, stereo specific. That means that it only creates amino acids wherever amino acids are created, presumably in plants, because 
plants are the only things that can make new protein. Um, uh, only make amino acids in, in one form, either plus or, or minus, whatever the, the, the chosen form is. Um, but it means that if we were, you know, if we were to think about a molecule like this, and that is a single molecule, although it takes a while to get your head around that, then every single one of these amino acids that's, that's not glycine will have a chiral center. So that molecule has, you know, over a over hundred different chiral centers. How, does, how is nature so specific? Well, it in, incorporates its stereospecificity into the things that do the work in the plant, in the cell, which are the enzymes. So enzymes, as I'm, I'm sure you know from, from your biology, have this kind of lock and key uh, mechanism. We have, a, we have an enzyme which has a, you know, a particular shape, particular three-dimensional geometry. And, and it's not even just shape either. It would, it would be a particular set of charges. Like there would be a you know, there'll be a, an alkyl group here with van der Waals forces and maybe something positively charged here and something negatively charged around there. All the charges are specific as well. <coughs> but on top of that, 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 that lock there would have a very specific chiral structure. So the three-dimensional structure of that, of that will only fit the, the substrate, which is the bit that goes into it, only fit the substrate which has the right charges and the right um, 3D chiral stereo orientation to fit into that. Can I draw it now? It's going to be hard. There we go. That's my, that's my substrate. So that, that can fit in there and then when it's, when it's in then the enzyme will do its thing and it'll add a hydrogen or take off a hydrogen or split the molecule in two or join two molecules together. The amazing things that enzymes can do at room temperature, atmospheric pressure, um, because they are so specific. So yeah, it's not just shape, I don't know what the biologists tell you, but the, the enzymes would only fit one stereoisomer into that, into that lock. Okay, I think that's all I want to say about that. I feel like I've forgotten something, but I can't remember what it is. That's a common feeling. Any questions? Okay.